This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Westfield Sports Centre, can I help you? Yes, I hope so. I've recently moved to the area and I want to do some sports activities. Well, we have excellent facilities, including a new gymnasium and several tennis courts. Our tennis team are always looking for new people. Oh, I was never any good at gymnastics and I don't think I've got the time to put into learning tennis. Um, no, I'm more interested in swimming and I'd also like to take a few yoga classes if I can. OK. Well, we have three swimming pools, an Olympic-size 50-metre pool and a 25-metre pool, uh, which are both outdoors, and a heated indoor pool, which is just 15 metres long, uh, but is very popular with our members in the winter. I bet it is. Do members have to pay to use the pools? Well, members don't pay for the pools if they just want to swim laps on their own. We even offer complimentary classes for beginners, but we do charge a small fee if you want to take part in the advanced training sessions. And there's also a fee for our water-based Keep Fit class. Right. And would I need to book any of the facilities, or can I just come whenever I want? We don't actually allow anyone to book the swimming lanes or the gym equipment, but for safety reasons, we can only have a maximum of seven people in the sauna at any one time, so you do need to put your name on the list for that. Fine. Now, I'd also really like to take a yoga class. Do you have any? Yes. There are classes on Monday, Tuesday and Friday in the morning from 10 till 11. And then every Saturday and Sunday in the evening. Those classes are a bit longer, starting at 6 and finishing at 7.30. Right. I'll just make a note of that. So, does that mean that if I enrol, I can come on each of those days? No, each day is a different level, so you only come once a week. Oh, I see. Well, I've been doing yoga for a little while now, but I am still finding it quite difficult. Which level do you think I should choose? Most people start at the lowest level, and then you can talk to the instructor about changing if you think it's too easy. OK. How much are the classes? They're £1.50 an hour for members. Great. Now, I'd like to come in and look at the facilities. Would someone be able to show me around? Yes, no problem. Who should I ask for? Ask for me. My name is John Doherty. That's D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. And should I just ask for you at the reception? Actually, my office is on a different level. Take the lift up to level one and you'll see my name on the door right in front of you. Great. Um, I'd like to come tomorrow, if that's OK. What time suits you? Well, I have appointments from 9 to 10.30, so could you make it 11? I'm sure that will be fine. But can I just take your direct number in case something else crops up? <laughs> that's a good idea. My number's 0117. Nine six five four seven eight. Great. I think that's everything, so I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, my name's Alison Martin, by the way. Thanks, Alison. See you tomorrow. That is the end of part one. Now turns to part two.
you'll hear a coordinator for the annual ski and snowboard exhibition talking to the audience about some practical information for the whole event. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the annual Ski and Snowboard Exhibition held from April the 8th to 17th. I am Mary Granger, coordinator of the event this year. The 10-day event features many highlights. As a snow sports lover, I know you are looking forward to a great time here. Now. I'd like to offer you some practical information about the whole event and what to expect from it. This might be the first time coming here for some of you, so for those who are still wondering about the right accommodation, I recommend Sky Hotel. It has its own health and sports clubs, just like most of the hotels here, but I love it because of its incredibly cosy beds, which guarantees good rest after an exhausting day of exploration. If you haven't brought your own equipment, like poles, boots and skis, they are available for purchase or rent at Ski Set or Snow Rental. The exhibition this year provides a colourful look into the history of skiing and an inspiring peek into the future prospects of the sport. Apart from the fascinating photo exhibitions and the most up-to-date skiing gear like always, this year we have added four computers which can imitate the process of skiing, ensuring the same physical activity and sensations that appear during the skiing process on downhill slopes. But I have to warn you that it might be quite time-consuming to line up for the free trial experience. Many have posed the question as to how to enter the skiing and snowboarding competition. Well, rather than filling out the back of the entrance ticket or bombarding the committee with emails, the most effective method is by checking out the exhibition newsletter delivered every month for availability. At the most beloved local event, the exhibition has also drawn attention from the press. Last year, massive media coverage was on the worrisome amount of snowfalls. In order to avoid the same predicament, several artificial skiing slopes have been built. With more participants this year, we have lowered the entrance fee, which has been widely reported to local newspapers. A bonus for our participants is the Ski Programme. It offers a wide variety of lessons and sessions with qualified instructors, ensuring that all ages and abilities are catered to, from the first-timers to seasoned amateurs. I strongly advise you to sign up for the programme, as it is offering an unprecedented 30% discount. That's mainly because we are cooperating with the programme organiser who promises affordable prices only for the participants of the festival this year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. 
A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. The director, Andy Fisher, will be there addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a conversation between a student and her professor talking about a summer course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, Mr. Thompson. May I speak to you for a minute? Of course. Please come in. I'm Alexandra Jones. I'm studying sustainability here at the university, and I heard about the summer course that you offer every year. I was considering joining the course and wanted to ask you some questions about it. Yes, of course. Please fire away. Has the course been effective in improving the environment? Yes, absolutely. We have seen great results. Last year we planted a small field of trees and we have been measuring their oxygen outputs to see the benefits that they have provided to the environment. Since we were regulated by law last month, we are now able to hugely enhance our efforts. Our current goal is to introduce a lot more tree species to the plot so that we can establish a complex habitat and compare the benefits of each species. In order to do this, we need to get a lot more students involved in the project. So, I am very pleased to hear about your interest. Well, the project sounds fascinating. I would definitely like to be involved. Absolutely. Over the years, we have received funding from private investors and from selling shares. But the biggest improvement in our research came from a government fund that we received in the first year. This has greatly improved the organisation and we have since won prizes for our research. Wow, how impressive! Yes, it is of the utmost importance to our organisation that we find a way to repair the terrible damage that has been done to the environment by the human species. This is no small undertaking, and our resources still need management, 
But from reports taken of our studies, we have found that teachers and students have greatly benefited from field trips to the tree plantation. Yes, I visited the plantation myself on a field trip two years ago, and I found myself greatly impressed by it. We have received a lot of feedback from visiting groups, telling us how impressed teachers, researchers, and students alike have been during their visits. Due to the educational facilities that we have carefully structured, I know that the visits are useful and engaging for students, and that their experience is particularly special. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So, what is the particular focus of the organisation and the reports that it provides? I am personally very interested in soil erosion, so I knew that I definitely wanted to focus some of the report on this area. Before I set up the organisation, I looked up information on what areas were currently being researched. And I found that there were already studies into air pollution and water pollution. I obviously wanted to find a unique area to research, and so these were no good. I was tempted to look into the background of overgrazing, but the impacts of forest exploitation are far more devastating, and very little research has been carried out on this subject. So I decided that this should also form some focus for the report. Yes, that makes sense. What have you found to be the greatest benefits of the activities carried out by the organisation? I have found that the greatest benefits are not the ones that anyone can learn from a book, like how to collect data, but more importantly, are life lessons that one can gain only from experience. Students who have partaken in the summer course have massively enhanced their confidence. Which will prove invaluable for the rest of their lifetime. The people who partake in the summer course already know the importance of environmental protection, so it is not important that we spend time teaching them this. Students instead benefit from learning the importance of punctuality, as each day they have to wake up early to make sure that they are not late for their practical experience sessions. If I decide to attend the summer course. What will I be doing for the rest of the time when no activities are going on? Well, we unfortunately don't yet have a library on site, so you would be unable to read reference books. Although you are obviously welcome to bring some books of your own with you, we offer a range of fun hobbies, such as games and painting, for students to participate in outside of their classes. So you could participate in one of these activities. We do not offer tutorials outside of the scheduled classes. However, you are free to interview teachers and ask them any questions you may have about the research. Well, the course sounds fantastic. I would definitely like to participate during the summer. Thank you so much for your help. No problem at all. Here is a form with all of the details. I look forward to seeing you there. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how, with time, we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space, or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter. A scientific unit only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government, since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. So, now I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year. Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed, from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple 